you have to practice who you want to be. You know, you don't wake up one morning and you're suddenly who you think you want to be. You have to put some energy into it. So if you want to be an honest person, you have to be an honest person every day, even starting at three and four and five, right? If you're going to be a hard worker, hard work doesn't just appear. You have to practice hard work. Uh, you have to practice effort. And I also encourage them, try to help them understand that good things don't come easy you know, with that effort. You know, uh, that's where you grow. That's where growth is. Some of the best times in my life when I've grown, it's when I've done something hard, uh, when I've overcome a fear. You don't realize that when you're doing it, but when you come out on the other side, you realize, wow, I've really uh, stepped up. So I push my girls, but more importantly, I love them a lot. And that's what I feel for all of you. I want you guys to feel that in your lives so that you can be excellent. Because other people told me that I might not be able to, to do well in school for whatever reason. I was always a good student. I worked hard, but I thought there was some magic <laughs> that happened that made you really, you know, I didn't know that it was just plain old hard work. So there were periods of doubt for sure. I think we all, I have doubts today. Doubts don't go away. Um, you just learn how to deal with them. You, you start knowing yourself and you become more confident. The more successes you have, the more chances you take, you don't let the, the failures or the stumbles define you. You know, everybody falls every now and then. Some people fall a lot. And what I realize is that we have long lives if we're healthy and we do what we're supposed to do. Uh, I'm 47 years old. So think about it. When, whatever mistake I made when I was 13, who cares? <laughs> so think about life as a long trajectory. But at the same time, you don't want to make huge mistakes. Because when you're young, making big, big mistakes can last forever, right? So you want to choose wisely. But the stumbles, the lessons learned, that's part of life that, that makes you grow. But I, I came to know that. I didn't know that when I was your age. I thought every, every mistake was the end of the world. I'll never be able, I'll never get into school. I'll never be, you know, of course, we all feel that way. Um, but just continue to work, put the, put the effort in. And I think that has been some of what's helped me being First Lady. First, first of all, is knowing who you are and being confident in yourself because there'll be, Clarissa, what did you say, pushing beyond other people's labels of you, right? That's a big part. That's what we do to each other all the time. We don't even know each other, and we already determine from one glance meeting, one line, one word, one phrase, this is who you are. So you have to know who you are before that. <laughs> and, you, and you live that reality, and you keep living it out no matter what. And if you good, have good character and, and good intentions, that that ultimately shines through. But in the end, it's hard work. And I like to work hard, and I, I like to do good things. And you practice that now. And believe it or not, I didn't know it. It prepared me to be the First Lady of the United States. I didn't know. I guess I'm doing okay. But you know what? <laughs> Every day we just get up and keep doing what we think is the right thing. Read, write, read, read. If the president were here. One of his greatest strengths is reading. That's one of the reasons why he's a good communicator, why he's such a good writer. He's a voracious reader. So we're trying to get our girls, no matter what, to just be, to love reading and to challenge themselves with what they read, not just read the gossip books, but push themselves beyond and do things that maybe they wouldn't do. So I would encourage you all to, to read 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 just keep reading and writing is another skill it's practice it's practice the more you write the better you get drafts uh, our kids are learning the first draft means nothing you're going to do seven ten drafts that's writing it's not failure it's not not the teacher not liking you because it's all marked up in red 
when you get to be a good writer, you mark your own stuff in red, and you rewrite, and you rewrite, and you rewrite. That's what writing is. Um, and if you come out with those skills, and then you're confident, and you can articulate, and you can stand up straight and look anybody in the eye and say, this is who I am, it's a pleasure to meet you. And that's one of the things we try to do with our mentoring program with young girls. My message to them is if you can walk into the White House and meet the First Lady and say, my name is, how are you, and look me in the eye, then there's nothing you can't do. That's why it's important. If you guys walked here, are sitting here in front of all these people, standing tall, asking questions, using your voice, you have to practice that. These arenas just show up again and again, and then you just get used to it. The nerves go away, and you start relaxing into your own abilities. But it's practice. When you are struggling, and you start thinking about giving up, I want you to remember something that my husband and I have talked about since we first started this journey nearly a decade ago. Something that has carried us through every moment in this White House and every moment of our lives. And that is the power of hope. The belief that something better is always possible if you're willing to work for it and fight for it. It is our fundamental belief in the power of hope that has allowed us to rise above the voices of doubt and division, of anger and fear that we have faced in our own lives and in the life of this country. Our hope that if we work hard enough and believe in ourselves, then we can be whatever we dream, regardless of the limitations that others may place on us. The hope that when people see us for who we truly are, maybe, just maybe, they too will be inspired to rise to their best possible selves. Shoot, it's the hope of my folks like my dad. Got up every day, do his job at the city water plant. The hope that one day his kids would go to college and have opportunities he never dreamed of. That's the kind of hope that every single one of us, politicians, parents, preachers, all of us, need to be providing for our young people. Because that is what moves this country forward every single day. Our hope for the future and the hard work that hope inspires. I want our young people to know that they matter, that they belong. So don't be afraid. You hear me? Young people, don't be afraid. Be focused. <laughs> be determined. Be hopeful. Be empowered. Empower yourselves with a good education. Then get out there and use that education to build a country worthy of your boundless promise. Lead by example with hope. Never fear. So I figured something out that I okay. thought I'd tell you about. This took me like 30 years to figure out, and I figured it out on this tour. So there's this old idea, you know, that you have to rescue your father from the belly of the whale, right? From mm -hmm. some monster that's deep in the abyss. You see that in Pinocchio, for example, but it's a very common idea. And I figured out why that is, I think. So imagine that we already know from a clinical perspective that, you know, if you set out a path towards a goal, which you want to do because you need a goal and you need a path because mm -hmm. that provides you with positive emotion, right? So you set up something as valuable, so that implies a hierarchy. You set up something as valuable. You decide that you're going to do that instead of other things, so that's kind of a sacrifice because you're sacrificing everything else to pursue that. And then you experience a fair bit of positive emotion and meaning as you watch yourself move towards the goal. And so the implication of that is the the better the goal, the 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 more full and rich your experience is going to be when you pursue it. So that's one of the reasons of, of that's one of the reasons for developing a vision and for fleshing yourself out philosophically because you want to aim at the highest goal that you can manage. Okay, so you do that, and then what you'll find is that as you move towards the goal, there are certain things that 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 you have to accomplish that frighten you. You know, maybe you have to learn to be a better speaker, a better writer, a better thinker. You have to be better to people around you, or you have to learn some new skills and you're afraid of that. 
whatever because it's going to stretch you if you if you pursue a goal and it's and so that'll put you up against challenges okay so all the clinical data indicates well the opposite of safe spaces as jonathan Haidt has been pointing out that what you want to do when you identify something that someone is avoiding that they need to do because they're afraid you have them voluntary con- voluntarily confronted and so you break it down what you try to do if you're a behavior therapist is you break down the thing they're avoiding into smaller and smaller pieces until you find a piece that's small enough so they'll do it and it doesn't really matter as long as they start it you know then they can put the next piece on and the next piece and what happens is they don't get less afraid exactly they get braver they get they get it's like there's more of them and you can and then here's why so imagine you do something new and that's informative right there's information in the action and then you can incorporate that information and turn it into a skill and turn it into a transformation of your perceptions so there's more to you because you've tried something new so that's one thing the second thing is and there's good biological evidence for this now that if you put yourself in a new situation then new genes code for new proteins and build new neural structures and new nervous system structures same thing happens to some degree when you work out right because you're your muscles are responding to the load, but your nervous system does that too. So you imagine that there's a lot of potential you locked in your genetic code. And then if you put yourself in a new situation, then then the stress, that's the situational stress that's produced by that particular situation unlocks those genes and then builds new parts of you. And so that's very cool because who knows how much there is locked inside of you. Okay, so now here's the idea. So let's assume that that scales as you take on heavier and heavier loads that more and more of you you get more and more informed because you're doing more and more difficult things but more and more of you gets unlocked and so then what that would imply is that if you got to the point where you could look at the darkest things so that would be the abyss right that would be the deepest abyss if you could look at the harshest things like the most brutal parts of the suffering of the world and the malevolence of people and society you could look that look at that straight and and directly that that would turn you on maximally and so that's the idea of rescuing your father because imagine that you're like the potential composite of of all your all the ancestral wisdom that's locked inside of you biologically but that's not going to come out at all unless you stress yourself unless you unless you challenge yourself and the bigger the challenge you take on the more that's going to turn on and so that as you take on a broader and broader range of challenges and you push yourself harder, then more and more of what you could be turns on and that's equivalent to transforming yourself into the ancestral father. Into all, because you're, you're like the, what would you call it? You're the consequence of all these living beings that have come before you. And that's all part of your biological potentiality. And then if you can push yourself, then all of that clicks on. And that turns you into who you could be. That's and that's the re-representation of that positive ancestral father. The point is your best strategic position is how am I insufficient and how can I rectify that? That's what you've got. And the thing is, you are insufficient. And you could rectify it. You, both of those are within your grasp. If you aim low enough. And one of the things why you do you do, see the you, that's another thing you keep saying, aim low enough, have a low enough bar. Why do you why do you mean that? Well, let's say you've got a kid and you want the kid to improve. You don't set them a bar that's so high that it's impossible for them to attain it. You take a look at the kid and you think, okay, this kid's got this range of skill. Here's a challenge we can throw at him or her that exceeds their current level of skill, but gives them a reasonable probability of success. And so, like I'm saying it tongue in cheek to some degree, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, but if you're, but I'm doing it as an aid to humility. It's like, well, I don't know how to start improving my life. Someone might say that. And I would say, well, you're not aiming low enough. There's something you could do that you are regarding as trivial, that, that, that you could do, that you would do, that would result in an actual improvement. But it's not a big enough improvement for you, so you won't lower yourself enough to take the opportunity. Incremental steps. And, yes. And, so and, this is also what is achieved through exercise. It's one of the most important... Yeah. Well, what do you do when you go and lift weights? Yeah. You don't go and... Like, if you haven't right, bench pressed before, you don't put 400 pounds on the damn bar and drop the, and drop the bar through your skull. Right. You know, you think, look, when I started working out when I was a kid, I was, I was weighed about 130 pounds and I was six foot one. I was a thin kid and I smoked a lot. I wasn't in good shape wasn't in good physical shape 
and I went to the gym and it was bloody embarrassing, you know, and people would come over and help me with the goddamn weights. Here's how you're supposed to use this. You know, it was humiliating. And maybe I was pressing 65 pounds or something at that point. You know, but what am I going to do? I'm going to lift up 150 pounds and injure myself right off the bat? No, I had to go in there and strip down and put my skinny goddamn self in front of the mirror and think, son of a bitch, there's all these monsters in the gym who've been lifting weights for 10 years and I'm struggling to get 50 pounds off the bar. Tough luck for me, but I could lift 50 pounds and it wasn't very long until I could lift 75. And well, you know how it goes. But, and I never injured myself when I was weightlifting. And the reason for that was I never pushed myself past where I knew I could go. And I pushed myself a lot. You know, I gained 35 pounds of muscle in about three years in, in university. I kind of had to quit because I was eating so goddamn much I couldn't stand it. It's eating like six meals a day. It was just taking up too much time. But there's a humility in determining what it is that the wretched creature that you are can actually manage. Aim low. And I, I don't mean don't aim. And I don't mean don't aim up. But you have to accept the fact that you can set yourself a goal that you can attain. And there's not going to be much glory in it to begin with. Because if you're not in very good shape, the goal that you could attain, could attain tomorrow isn't very glorious. But it, it's a hell of a lot better than nothing, and it beats the hell out of bitterness, and it's way better than blaming someone else. It's way less dangerous. And you could do it. And what's cool about it, there's a statement in the New Testament. It's called the Matthew Principle, and economists use it to describe how the economy and the world works. To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. It's like what's very pessimistic in some sense because it means that as you start to fail, you fail more and more rapidly. But it also means that as you start to succeed, you succeed more and more rapidly. And so you take an incremental step and, well, now you can lift 55 pounds instead of 52.5 pounds. You think, well, what the hell is that? It's like it's one step on a very long journey. And so it's, it, and it starts to compound on you. So a small step today means puts you in a position to take a slightly bigger step the next day. And then that puts you in a position to take a slightly bigger step the next day. And you do that for two or three years, man, you're starting to stride. I found that nothing in life is worthwhile unless you take risks, nothing. Nelson Mandela said, there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living. Now, I'm sure in your experiences in school and applying to college and picking your major and deciding what you want to do with life, I'm sure people have told you to make sure you have something to fall back on. Make sure you got something to fall back on, honey. But I never understood that concept, having something to fall back on. If I'm going to fall, I don't want to fall back on anything except my faith. I want to fall forward. I figure at least this way I'll see what I'm going to hit. Fall forward. This is what I mean. Reggie Jackson struck out 2,600 times in his career, the most in the history of baseball. But you don't hear about the strikeouts. People remember the home runs fall forward. Thomas Edison conducted 1,000 failed experiments. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Because the 1,001st was the light bulb. Fall forward. Every failed experiment is one step closer to success. You've got to take risks, and I'm sure you've probably heard that before, but I want to talk to you about why that's so important. First, you will fail at some point in your life, accept it. You will lose. You will embarrass yourself. You will suck at something. There's no doubt about it. And I know that's probably not a traditional message for a graduation ceremony, but hey, I'm telling you, embrace it because it's inevitable. And I should know. In the acting business, you fail all the time. Early on in my career, I auditioned for a part in a Broadway musical perfect role for me, I thought, except for the fact that I can't sing. So I'm, I'm in the wings, I'm about to go on stage, but the guy in front of me, he's singing like, 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 
Pavarotti. He's just and he's just going on and on and on. And I'm just shrinking. I'm getting smaller and smaller. So they say, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you will, you'll be hearing from us. So I come out with my little sheet music and it, it was, it was uh, just my imagination by the temptations. That's what I came up with. So I hand it to the, 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 the accompanist and uh, she looks at it and looks at me and looks out at the director and was like, nice. So I, I start, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna sing. I'm like, it's just my imagination. Once again, and then coming away with me. And I'm not saying anything, so I'm thinking I'm getting better. So I, I could start getting into it. It was just my <laughs> Running. This, oh, yeah, uh, th yeah th thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Washington. Thank you. So I assumed I didn't get the job. But the next part of the audition, he called me back. The next part of the audition is the acting part of the audition. So I'm like, hey, okay, maybe I can't sing, but I know I can act. So they pair me with this guy. And again, I didn't know about musical theater. And musical theater is big, so they can reach everyone all the way in the back of the, of the stadium. And I'm more from a realistic, uh, naturalistic kind of acting where you, you, know, you actually talk to the person next to you. So I, I don't know what my line was. My line was, well, hand me the cup. And his line was, well, I will hand you the cup, my dear. The cup will be there to be handed to you. I, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> well, should I give you the cup back? Oh, yes, you should give it back to me because you know that is my cup and it should be given back to me. I didn't get the job. <laughs> but here's the thing. I didn't quit. I didn't fall back. I walked out of there to prepare for the next audition and the next audition and the next audition. I prayed. I prayed and I prayed. But I continued to fail and fail and fail, but it didn't matter because you know what? There's an old saying, you hang around the barbershop long enough, sooner or later you're gonna get a haircut. So you will catch a break, and I did catch a break. Last year, I did a play called Fences on Broadway. Someone talked about it. Won the Tony Award. I, and I didn't have to sing, by the way. <laughs> But here's the kicker. It was at the court theater. It was at the same theater that I failed that first audition 30 years prior. The point is every graduate here today has the training and the talent to succeed. But do you have the guts to fail? Here's my second point about failure. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. I'll say it again. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. My wife told me this great expression. To get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. Les Browns, a motivational speaker, he made an analogy about this. He says, imagine you're on your deathbed and standing around your deathbed are the ghosts representing your unfulfilled potential. The ghost of the ideas you never acted on. The ghost of the talents you didn't use. And they're standing around your bed angry, disappointed and upset. They say, we, we came to you because you could have brought us to life, they say. And now we have to go to the grave together. So I ask you today, how many ghosts are gonna be around your bed when your time comes? You've invested, you, you've invested a lot in your education and people have invested in you. And let me tell you, the world needs your talents, man, does it ever. I just got back from Africa like two days ago, so if I'm rambling on, it's because I'm jet lag. I just got back from South Africa. It's a beautiful country, but there are places there with terrible poverty that need help. And Africa is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. The Middle East needs your help. Japan needs your help. Alabama needs your help. Tennessee needs your help. Louisiana needs your help. Philadelphia needs your help. 
The world needs a lot and we need it from you. We really do. We need it from you young people. I mean, I'm not speaking for the rest of us up here, but I know I'm getting a little grayer. We need it from you, the young people, because remember this. So you got to get out there. You got to give it everything you got, whether it's your time, your, your, your talent, your prayers, or your treasures. Because remember this, you will never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. You can't take it with you. The Egyptians tried it. And all they got was robbed. So the question is, what are you going to do with what you have? I'm not talking about how much you have. Some of you are business majors, some of you are theologians, nurses, sociologists, some of you have money, some of you have patience, some of you have kindness, some of you have love, some of you have the gift of long suffering, whatever it is, whatever your gift is, what are you going to do with what you have? All right, now here's my last point about failure. Sometimes it's the best way to figure out where you're going. Your life will never be a straight path. I began at Fordham University as a pre-med student. I, 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 I took a course called the car, cardiac morphogenesis. I still can't say it. <laughs> cardiac, cardiac morphogenesis. I couldn't read it. I couldn't say it. I sure couldn't pass it. <laughs> so then I decided to go into pre-law, then journalism. And with no academic focus, my grades took off in their own direction. Yeah, down. I was a 1.8 GPA one semester, and the university very politely suggested that it might be better to take some time off. I was 20 years old. I was at my lowest point. And then one day, and I remember the exact day, March 27, 1975, I was helping my mother in her beauty shop. My mother owned a beauty shop up in Mount Vernon. And there's, there was this older woman who was uh, considered one of the elders in the town. And I didn't know her personally, but I, I was looking in the mirror and every time I looked at the mirror, I could see her be behind me and she was staring at me. She just kept looking at me. Every time I looked at her, she kept giving me these strange looks. So she finally took the dryer off her head and said, to some, she said something I'll never forget. First of all, she said, somebody give me a piece of paper, give me a piece of paper. She said, young boy, I have a prophecy, a spiritual prophecy. She said, you are going to travel the world and speak to millions of people. Now, mind you, I'm 20 years old. I'm flunked out of school. In fact, like a wise ass, I'm thinking to myself, maybe she's got something in that crystal ball about me getting back into school next fall. But maybe she was on to something because later that summer, while working as a counselor at a YMCA camp in Connecticut, we put on a talent show for the campers. And after the show, another counselor came up to me and asked, have you ever thought about acting? You're good at that. So when I got back to Fordham that fall, I got in and I changed my major once again for the last time. And in the years that followed, just as that woman prophesied, I have traveled the world and I have spoken to millions of people through my movies. Millions who up till this day couldn't see me, I, who, who up till this day I couldn't see while I was talking to them and they couldn't see me, they could only see the movie. They couldn't see the real me. But I see you today and I'm encouraged by what I see and I'm strengthened by what I see and I love what I see. Today, I want to tell you three stories from my life. That's it. No big deal. Just three stories. The first story is about connecting the dots. I dropped out of Reed College after the first six months, but then stayed around as a drop-in for another 18 months or so before I really quit. So why'd I drop out? It started before I was born. My biological mother was a young, unwed graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates, so everything was all set for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out, 
they decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, who were on a waiting list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, we've got an unexpected baby boy, do you want him? They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. And 17 years later, I did go to college. But I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. After six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. The minute I dropped out, I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. I didn't have a dorm room, so I slept on the floor in friends' rooms. I returned Coke bottles for the five cent deposits to buy food with. And I would walk the seven miles across town every Sunday night to get one good meal a week at the Hare Krishna temple. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture. And I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me. And we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that calligraphy class, and personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference.